Hello and welcome to yet another episode of the Black Archive Visual Podcast, episode 9, which is made possible by the Harvard South African Fellowship run through the Center for African Studies here at Harvard University. For exciting events and all things Africa at Harvard, I encourage you to visit our website at www.africa.harvard.edu. Detailed information on opportunities for fellowships, funding for undergraduate and graduate programs, as well as exciting research and public engagement listings can be accessed on our website. I am Sisebo Kumalo, your host and a visiting fellow of the Harvard South African Fellowship Program, as well as a lecturer of philosophy at the University of Port Hare in South Africa, where I teach on social and political philosophy, feminist and queer theory, decoloniality, and the Black Archive. Today, I am joined by the distinguished, kind, and incredibly generous Professor Paul Tiambe Zaleza, my senior in all meanings of the term. Paul currently serves as Associate Provost at the North Star and the North Star Distinguished Professor at Case Western Reserve University, a leading American research university. His immediate past appointment was at the United States International University Africa in Nairobi, Kenya, where he served as Vice Chancellor and President as, and, and Professor of Social Sciences and Humanities. Prior to that, for 25 years, he held distinguished academic and administrative positions in Canada as college principal at Trent University, center director at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, department chair at the University of Illinois at Chicago, college dean at Loyola Mary, Marymount University and academic vice president at Quinnipiac University. Altogether, he has been at a dozen universities in six countries on three continents and the Caribbean region. He served his, he received his bachelor's degree uh, with distinction at the University of Malawi, his master's training at the University of London in Britain, and his PhD at, the, at Dalhousie University in, Can, in Canada. Paul has held the positions of honorary professor at the University of Cape Town since 2006 and at the Nelson Mandela University since 2019. He has served in more than two dozen international and national associations, most recently as a member of the Administrative Board of the International Association of Universities, the Advisory Board of the Alliance for African Partnership, University of Ghana Council, Chair of the Advisory Council of the Carnegie Ad Africa Diaspora Fellowship Program, and Chair of the Board of Trustees of the Kenya Education Network. In 2008 and 2009, he served as President of the U.S. African Studies Association, he has raised tens of millions of dollars for institutional advancement and personal research. So, Paul, thank you so much and, and welcome uh, on to the Black Archive Visual Podcast. I think I want to start off with your most recent experience in terms of the transition from your project working in the humanities and social sciences and what that has meant in terms of your experiences of trying to articulate what it means for us to think about an African university on the continent. Mm. First of all, thank you for the opportunity to talk with you. Yes, uh, the transition has been at multiple levels. One is, of course, at the intellectual level, mm -hmm. uh, dealing with uh, the humanities and social sciences in their breadth and depth. Uh, and at the same time, as an administrator, as you noted, uh, my most recent appointment was in Kenya's vice chancellor. Uh, one is dealing, of course, with disciplines across the board. Mm -hmm. You know, the, you're dealing with the sciences, you're dealing with business, you're dealing with uh, the health sciences, and so on and so forth. And and what that do, uh, the, what that does is that it reinforces, in my view, the importance of the humanities mm -hmm. and social sciences, uh, while at the same time, of course, uh, developing a deep appreciation mm. of what the other branches of knowledge contribute. And, and uh, for me, uh, eventually what it all does is simply to um, underscore the importance of interdisciplinarity, yes. that uh, our students in the natural sciences, as well as, of course, in the professional fields like business, law, and so on, medicine, mm. uh, need to you know, understand uh, mm. and develop uh, liberal, liberal education competences, mm -hmm. critical thinking, communication, you know, interpersonal, intercultural, international <laughs> understanding of how things work. And at the same time, I think um, students in the humanities and social sciences also mm. need to develop uh, certain basic features of those other fields, quantitative literacy, uh, scientific literacy, 
uh, because in the end, uh, you know, our lives are guided by yeah. all these, di you know, dimensions of, of social life. Uh, so uh, f for me, simply, I've come to appreciate even more deeply mm. the importance of interdisciplinarity mm -hmm. uh, or some, what some people call multidisciplinarity, transdisciplinarity. Of course, all those uh, have different sort of uh, implications. implications. Mm. Uh, and, and at the same time, uh, realizing that... Um, these conversations are not easy. Mm. They're very difficult because all of us are wedded to our disciplinary formation or disciplinary bringing, mm -hmm. as it were. Mm. Uh, but I think we have to have the generosity of spirit mm. and, and inquisitiveness uh, to appreciate that you know, all of us are looking at the elephant mm. called social reality. And, and we are all seeing the elephant from different angles. And in all our sort of combined collective uh, sharing of, of, of our perspectives, we develop a much fuller understanding yes. of what we are looking at. Absolutely. And, and this sort of brings me to the follow-up question, which is to say, you know, as a higher education practitioner, administrator, you've kind of been at the interface, at the coalface of the, the transitions of the humanities and the social sciences on the African continent. Um, I remember a very, very interesting book that had quite a lot of influence, for example, in social and political philosophy, which was Rethinking um, Globalization in Africa, which came out in 2003, that two-part mm -hmm. um, volume that you did in that, in that, in, in that project. And, and what I was fascinated there by was, I was fascinated by your call to kind of think about the implications for globalization as it is impacting mm -hmm. the African mm -hmm. continent. Mm -hmm. um, and I think to a certain extent, that particular project kind of, there's a circling back in the, in the contemporary work that you're doing now, whereby we're thinking about exactly the, so, the problems of society mm -hmm. responding to African conditions from a perspective of, you know, thinking about global relevance of institutions, but local responsiveness as well. Mm -hmm. um, and in thinking about precisely that particular project and what it meant at the time, you know, in this kind mm -hmm, of mm -hmm, mm -hmm. craze on the African continent, you know, the last country on the southernmost tip of the African continent mm -hmm. had just received democracy 10 years, nearly 10 mm -hmm. years ago right, when that project right. came out. What's been the, the thinking between the sort of post-colonial break, if one can call it that, mm -hmm. uh, on the African continent? the function of the university in Africa as it responds to African problems, African needs, science and technology as it is developing from the university in mm -hmm. response to, to, to societal needs on the continent, and an articulation of that to the global knowledge economy, mm -hmm. right? So, mm -hmm. so thinking about those three moments, the post-colonial, the responsiveness of scholarship to the continent as it articulates with the global mm -hmm. trends, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, that, that's a very rich, uh, very rich question. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think there are multiple levels at which we need to examine issues like this. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the uh, late 1990s, uh, early 2000s, you know, after the end of the Cold War, there was this sort of rediscovery of the global mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and a lot of writings on globalization in which, interestingly, not much was being done in terms of Africa's insertion mm -hmm. uh, into mm -hmm. that uh, globalization process. So what what I was trying to do in that book um, is, is simply to underscore that uh, you cannot understand globalization in all its uh, historical phases because it's not new. Yes. You know, it's, it's historical phases in all its dimensions without incorporating Africa's experience. Uh, so, the, you know, the emergence of the modern world system, uh, you know, and we call it modern because there were other world systems mm -hmm. uh, from mm -hmm. the 15th century. Africa, of course, is integral mm -hmm. uh, in, in terms of the slave trade, the construction of the economies and societies of the Americas, industrialization of Britain, and all those, um, you know, developments uh, of course, culminate in the colonization of Africa, which is also a global movement. Mm -hmm. And then the you know, struggles for decolonization, for independence, and so on, which is also a global movement. Mm -hmm. uh, so Africa has been integral to all the uh, developments in the world system, in the world economy, in the, in the, in, in, you know, the world um, um, uh, you know, 
all the multiple dimensions of the world, whether we're talking of material dimensions, economic, we're talking of uh, metaphysical in terms of thinking and thought and creation of institutions, including higher education. Mm -hmm. uh, Africa has been at the center of that. And, and I think one of the things is that um, we as African intellectuals uh, have to do is not to apologize mm -hmm. for the fact that we've been integral to the world. However, mm -hmm. uh, we all know, as Samir Amin taught us, and, and others, uh, including Walter Rodney and, and that whole body of thought uh, of dependence and development, yes. that it was not to our benefit. Yes. And therefore, how do we uh, interrogate these processes of globalization and at the same time uh, understand uh, the damage that they have done to Africa and how do we counter counteract uh, those developments. So, you know, the, the debate on globalization should not be a celebration. Mm -hmm. uh, it should be a critique mm -hmm. of the modern world, mm -hmm. how it has been formed. So that's one level. Having said that, it's also important to realize when it comes to education, uh, there is a very unfortunate tendency, in my view, to assume that higher education is, is, is an invention on the African mm -hmm. continent by col col colonialism, mm -hmm. coloniality. We all know, again, that uh, you know, the traditions of higher education on the continent, if you look at Africa as a continent mm -hmm. and not look at particular parts mm -hmm. in isolation, uh, higher education goes back you know, to, to uh, you know, before even 1000 uh, AD mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in places like Tunisia, Morocco, um, uh, Egypt, of course, al uh, and, and uh, you know, Mali, Timbuktu, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, Sankore University, and all that. Uh, but even more interesting, perhaps, in these debates is the very fact that what we call the Western or European University mm -hmm. borrowed deeply from, from the Islamic those historic. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. From, so, what comes to Africa as the Western is, in fact, uh, you know, imbued mm -hmm. with a lot of. Uh, Afro-Asiatic Islamic influences and traditions and yes. traditions so this notion that there is something purely Western mm. is a problem in itself mm -hmm. and uh, you know uh, our friend here at, at, at Harvard wrote a very interesting book about Islamic learning traditions Khan, mm -hmm. uh, you know which which underscores the fact that uh, even the, you know what Mudimbe calls the colonial library mm. uh, which might be very dominant in certain parts of Africa uh, it's not necessarily dominant in other parts of Africa mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. other intellectual traditions that mm -hmm. have survived yes. and continued. And, and he talks, of course, in this particular case of the Islamic tradition. Mm. So the, the issue of the academy mm. in Africa in terms of its origins, in terms of its developments, and the various forces mm -hmm. that have conti you know, contributed to its development is something that we have, I think, to critically interrogate. Having said that, I think one could say that um, the African university uh, is, is quite contradictory in the sense that it's the most internationalized mm. in one sense, mm. in terms of being very much uh, in, you know, the models, the institutional models, the intellectual debates, the paradigms, the research questions, methodologies that tend to be used in many of these disciplines, including the social sciences and humanities, uh, tend to be fairly, they take the signals from the global Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. what's happening in Euro-America, and now increasingly we're paying attention what's happening in Asia. Mm -hmm. And certainly, uh, if you look at things like under development dependency theory, uh, this was an invention of Latin America, mm -hmm. Latin American mm -hmm. scholars. So we've been very international in that sense. However, it o is also the most marginal mm -hmm. system mm -hmm. in the international uh, system, in the sense that uh, the, you know, African influences mm -hmm. on global sc scholarship <coughs> Uh, whether you're talking about theoretical uh, paradigms, you're talking of methodologies, you're talking about uh, even the questions we raise yes. in our scholarship. To what extent have those traveled to influence mm -hmm. developments elsewhere? Not very much. Mm. Uh, so there is this contradiction, therefore, of you know, highly internationalized, mm. but also peripheral mm -hmm. in the international system. So the issue becomes, in my view, how do we take all this uh, and, and craft uh, not only a university as envisaged, uh, you know, if you look, read the writings of the sort of um, the leaders of African independence movements, the Nkrumahs, uh, the, 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 the um, Nyerere's and so on, uh, and even the Mandela's, mm -hmm. uh, what you find is that 
they understand the African University's mission as one, of course, of being responsive, mm -hmm. relevant, and responsible mm -hmm. in terms of the knowledge it produces yes. for Africa. Yes. At the same time, mm -hmm. they see it as being uh, an institutional space mm -hmm. that should articulate Africa's global presence. Mm -hmm. So they don't see necessarily a dichotomy mm -hmm. between local relevance and, and internationalization mm -hmm. in, in, in an intellectual sense. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and of course, if you're going to be locally relevant and mm -hmm. responsive and responsible, your engagement with the global will be from your own terms. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the, dis, uh, you know, the debates uh, about decoloniality, about decolonization, fundamentally, Mm -hmm. about, the uh, they are about the relevance, mm -hmm. the responsiveness, mm -hmm. and the responsibility mm -hmm. of these institutions to their own contexts, mm -hmm. to their own societies, to mm -hmm. their own histories, mm -hmm. and to their own imaginations of the future. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, of course, is in conversation with other, you know, sort of, uh, um, you know, systems yes. that have developed. And, of course, the African intelligentsia uh, by, by definition, uh, is, is one that has you know, developed in ways that make it a bilingual, multilingual uh, uh, you know, intelligentsia. A lot of us, I mean, you and I are talking from Harvard, uh, a lot of us are very deeply immersed mm. in, 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 in um, you know, uh, uh, educational systems. Uh, many of us got the, the training or we have taught, we do research in collaboration and so on and so forth. So to assume that um, you know, um, the the decolonization means you know sort of cutting off the delinking, uh, de delinking, mm. which of course some people in the dependency literature used to mm. to articulate, uh, is 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 contrary to our very practice. Mm -hmm. uh, however, that uh, also means that we have to reflexively mm. think about our own practice. How, you know, a lot of us, for example, you know, I read a lot of this literature, and I'm always fascinated by a number of things. One, we, we are quite strident, and rightly so in some cases, about the need to you know, decolonize, and we need to push that agenda, obviously. Uh, and at the same time, there is a deep-seated longing to be legitimated in the global north. So we, you read uh, uh, many of these uh, sort of um, critical thinkers uh, in, in many of these debates. And, and if you just look at their footnotes and even the references they are making in the text, when it comes to talking of theory, mm -hmm. it's they importation. Typically, yeah, typically they are referring to Euro-American scholars, intellectuals, including the dead ones, uh, <laughs> and, 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 and very little reference to the African intellectual archive. Mm. to African thinkers. So you take the issue of decolonization. Mm. Um, this issue of contesting the hegemony mm -hmm. of Euro-American um, epistemological and the ontological uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, descriptions, definitions, and understandings of, 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 of uh, ideas and mm. of identities and so on, including of us, uh, this, this has been contested. Um, by African and African descended intellectuals for at least the last three, four hundred years. And yet, uh, many of us are busy quoting, you know, people who just started writing about some of these things uh, from the Euro-American Academy uh, 20, 30, 40 years That's ago. Cool. Uh, so I think we have to make sure that our practices of um, you know, pushing for the decolonization agenda mm. must be based on a deep immersion into In African intellectual, intellectual histories. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying <coughs> histories deliberately, because again, we have to avoid this homogenization. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. I'm not saying that people who talk of Africa are essentially, uh, you know, uh, essentialist. Mm -hmm. In fact, the, the argument of essentialism is used to attack mm -hmm. people who are contesting, yes. uh, you know, these narratives, Euro-American, Euro Eurocentric uh, yeah. narratives. Uh, but, but we have to be sensitive to the very fact that Africa is, is itself not homogeneous, yes. and, and therefore understand the different intellectual traditions mm. that have developed on this continent and they are very complicated conversations mm. 
Okay. Because your Islamic tradition has been in conversation with the colonial library yeah. say in parts of West Africa and parts of North Africa for a very long, long time. time. And they, they are very complicated negotiations that have taken place mm -hmm. and emergence of, of, of ways of understanding uh, that uh, are very rich as well as uh, very complicated. Now, Paul, you mentioned something that I think is so important, which is to say we've got a privilege our own intellectual histories. And I'm going to ask you a question. As you say, we're speaking from Harvard, mm -hmm. but both of us have a foot in Africa, mm -hmm. uh, be it through as a senior administrator, executive, as former vice chancellor and uh, principal of, a, of an institution in Kenya, be it as a visiting professor um, you know, at UCT or at Nelson Mandela University, or as myself, be it a philosophy lecturer. Uh, at the University of Fort Hill. The challenge with how our students are training, and, and I think this is one of the reasons why I, I, I have been inspired to do this kind of work while I'm here, which is to kind of create a cross-cultural conversation between Africa and her diasporan communities, but also to center the function of African scholarship and African intellectual histories, as mm -hmm, you say. Mm -hmm. so, V.Y. Mudimbe in 88 gives us, for example, the invention of Africa. Um, and it's a beautiful analysis. Methodologically, it's a fantastic, what is it, f uh, um, philosophical anthropological project. It, 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 he does a very, very good uh, philosophical anthropology in that mm -hmm, text. Mm -hmm. But he demonstrates the point of how Africa, African categories, ways of thinking about Africa, mm -hmm, ways of mm -hmm, analyzing mm -hmm, Africa, mm -hmm. are dreamt up. Mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. European colonial incursion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in the South African context, as one who has that experience of South Africa, post-apartheid South Africa means that the voice that kind of wins, right, or that, ha or that becomes centered, so it's no longer the Afrikaner nationalist conversation, it's no longer Stellenbosch University, mm -hmm. Free State mm -hmm. University, mm -hmm. the VAL uh, in terms of uh, North, what has, what has now become Northwest University mm -hmm. um, and uh, the University of Pretoria. The, the academic freedom lectures, for example, mm -hmm. become a thing. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if we remember correctly, the academic freedom lectures are definitive of the University of Natal, Rhodes University, UCT, Wits mm -hmm. University. Mm -hmm. um, memorialized to this day, in fact, at the University of Cape Town through the TB Davy mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. academic freedom lecture. And what that has done is that it has given, what that did, in fact, is that it gave white liberals, white South African liberals, mm -hmm. this kind of position of hegemony mm -hmm. um, in the country. And what our colleagues do is that they miseducate our students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and post 2015, which was the, the sort of moment of shattering of this mm -hmm. commitment to the miseducation, there have been younger scholars who've come up and who've said, actually, no, indeed, let's read mm -hmm. African mm -hmm. history intellectuals, mm -hmm. um, African intellectual histories. Let's, let's commit ourselves to doing the work of going back into how we have historically conceptualized, articulated, understood, debated, and contested mm -hmm. the function of education on the African continent. So how does the system Mm -hmm. with these misarticulations that you are rightfully noting of saying we are incredibly globally oriented but also incredibly marginalized. And part of the reason why we're marginalized, I think, is because to a very large extent, we're not having a, a sharing of knowledge between systems mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. white academics mm -hmm. are very, very insular mm -hmm. to, a, lot, to mm -hmm. a very large extent. They, 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 they are saying, okay, fine, we're focusing on Europe because, for instance, maybe that's where we trained, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And we're going to come back from Europe, we're going to go back to Africa, I mean, this mm -hmm. is what we're going mm -hmm. to train our mm -hmm. students. Mm -hmm. So how do we break the cycle? Right, right. Yeah, how do we break? That's the, mm. you know, the difficult question. So I think there are a, a number of uh, dimensions to this, to, to your very, uh, very insightful comment and question. So one of the things that uh, let, me, let me just give you a few sort of uh, factual points mm -hmm. of reference so when you look at publications by african you know uh, the african academy you mm -hmm. know in global terms uh, more than 50% of african 
scholarly publications are with people from the global north. Mm -hmm. um, that's a figure much, much higher than publications by Asian scholars, European scholars, American scholars. It doesn't mean they don't publish with other people, mm -hmm. but the proportions are much lower mm -hmm. than for Africa. And, and what it does underscore is what Huntonji talked about a long time. Mm. It's the extravasion yes. of our epistemic practices, um, so, uh, which is a replica of the extravasion of our mm. economies. Mm. They're very outwardly focused in which intra-African trade and in this case, intra-African intellectual production mm -hmm. uh, is much less mm. than the extra-continental intellectual collaborations and the extra-continental economic mm. engagements. Uh, so the first thing is precisely for us to make very concerted efforts, even at, at the basic sort of curricular level, uh, pedagogical level, at a basic you know, educational level for uh, teaching, for our students to engage uh, you know, in, the, in the writings of other Africans. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and that one, you know, of course we talk about the university, the system. Mm -hmm. you know, the vice chancellor doesn't go to tell a faculty, this is gonna be your syllabus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All of us make those individual decisions, of yeah. course, under a very interesting epistemic and institutional structure. Mm. But we do have autonomies mm -hmm. <laughs> that we sometimes... Academic freedom. Yeah, academic freedom, you know, which can be compromised mm. and all that. But, but you know, I, I always challenge when I look at, uh, you know, people's syllabuses, and I used to do that in, in, in when I was... Uh, I had an opportunity to see some syllabuses. It's like, why, why are all the readings in your text, mm. all of them, these, you know, European writers, American writers, why can't you incorporate, you know, a lot of our own writings. So that's the first thing that we have to take intra-African intellectual conversations seriously. Mm -hmm. And part of the articulation of that in practice is how we construct our syllabuses, our mm. curriculum, and so on. And we have autonomy in doing that. Your syllabus, your, nobody at Harvard is telling you how to set up your syllabus mm. in, 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 uh, <laughs> at your university. Mm -hmm. You've made a choice. Mm -hmm. At one level, of course, mm -hmm. there are all sorts of forces that at may be play. Yeah, at play to, that mm. drive you to do that. The second part is to what extent are we seriously engaging the scholarship of the African diaspora? Mm. How many of us have seriously read uh, people like Douglas, mm -hmm. Frederick Douglas, uh, read uh, people like W. B. Du Bois, mm -hmm. you know, uh, mm -hmm. one of the founders of American sociology? Uh, and, and, and this whole corpus mm -hmm. of intellectual production going back in that very encounter, mm -hmm. in the belly of the beast mm -hmm. of that encounter mm -hmm. in Europe, in, 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 uh, in the Americas mm -hmm. uh, from the 16th century, 17th century, 18th century, and definitely the 19th and 20th. Uh, to what extent have we engaged that scholarship? Mm -hmm. uh, and again, uh, why, when we are talking about decolonization, don't we have texts from mm. Blyden, mm. Edward Blyden? He was writing in the middle of the 19th century mm. about, you know, the, 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 you know, the um, development and interaction and contradictions and, and, and contaminations and mm -hmm. combinations of Islamic, uh, traditional, uh, Christian, uh, which uh, then, of course, uh, and Krumah picks up in his book, Conscientiousism. Ali Mazrui then picks up as Africa, the triple heritage. Mm. You, you can trace this. So, yes, that thought. Th th that thought, mm. Uh, mm. you know, and how it influences, um, you know, how things are done. So why can't we, you know, uh, do that kind of exercise with our mm. students to say this idea, this is the journey it has mm. traveled through texts mm. of African thinkers, texts of African diaspora thinkers. The third level, in my view, is to take seriously the ways in which other societies in the world that have been sub subjected to uh, the Western Imperium, mm -hmm. you know, to, to, to the Eurocentric um, and, uh, you know, imperial um, epistemological 
uh, order mm. uh, that we are all fighting, how have they dealt with it? Mm. Not that uh, the way they dealt with it... Is it, going to be replicated. Yeah, no, it won't. Mm. And, and, and mm. is better or worse. No. Mm. How have they dealt with it? And sometimes it serves as a mirror mm. for us to say, okay, this is how they dealt with it. That's similar in this way. It's different in that way. How, and then, what can we learn? What can we learn? And then mm. where it is different, why is it different? Mm -hmm. So it also helps you to particularize mm. your own experience at the same time as you're globalizing. Uh, it's, 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 the it's comparative a, the, analysis. In, in a comparative analysis. Yeah. So yeah. now, for example, our countries are gravitating to, to Asia economically. China is a bigger trading partner than, uh, than the United States from 2009. Uh, but to what extent are we seriously engaging Asian mm. thought, Asian, Asian um, um, scholarship and so on? So this, the, for me, part of the decol decolonization agenda is, is, of course, this is an odd statement. Um, you have to provincialize Europe, but mm -hmm. provincializing it also means uh, of course, deprovincializing Africa. Mm -hmm. And part of that deprovincialization of Africa mm. has to entail Africa taking itself seriously mm. in terms of these intra African dialogues, mm -hmm. as well as dialogues with the African diaspora and dialogues with other civilizations. I'm going to then follow up with a question as an administrator. You mm -hmm. have been an administrator now for a number of years. Mm -hmm. um, and what I appreciate, you know, you remind me of uh, Salim Badat. Mm, um, yes, yes, Salim yeah. or, or, was, was, has been an, administ was an administrator for a very long time, but he never stopped his intellectual work mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and his intellectual thought. When I arrived, for example, at the University of Pretoria in 2018, one of the challenges that I encountered or one of the challenges that I smashed my head against was this extroversion that you're talking about. So the way in which the subsidy funding model had been structured mm -hmm, mm -hmm. at the University of Pretoria was incredibly problematic because it encouraged scholars to publish in what we call ESI, World, what is it, uh, mm -hmm. uh, World Science Citation Index-based right, right, journals. Right, 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 right? right. so mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're publishing, if you get a paper out, for example, with uh, Critical uh, Philosophy of Race, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. edited by my good colleague Robert Berners-Coney at Penn State, mm -hmm. you get better money in your kitty, in yes, your research yes, kitty, yes, than, yes. for example, in publishing in the South African Journal of Philosophy, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and I found that incredibly problematic mm -hmm, as mm -hmm. an academic who was at the time attempting to establish the Journal of Decolonizing Disciplines. Right, right, right. So right, right, right. how do we, as academics, um, researchers specifically, because what has also happened on the African continent is that we've kind of drawn a line between mm -hmm. the academic who's a teacher, the academic who's a researcher, mm -hmm. which I think is fundamentally problematic mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. praxis ought to be informed by oh, yeah. research and yeah, research absolutely. ought to inform praxis. Mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. There needs to be a loop there. But how do we researchers resist mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. administrators, senior administrators, because mm -hmm. there was a mm -hmm. colleague of ours who mm -hmm. at the time was vice principal research mm -hmm. who who did not want to hear mm -hmm. and i said to mm -hmm. them I, you know, mm -hmm. every sing, at, at every single point i said to my colleague professor stephanie burton at the time mm -hmm. that you know th there's a problem you, mm -hmm. you are create mm -hmm. you are bankrupting our own mm -hmm. system mm -hmm. because you know the university of pretoria employs what nearly about 5000 what is it nearly about 5000 academic staff mm -hmm. right so all of these 5000 if they were to take your call Stephanie Burton, and publish mm -hmm. in, you know, the British, uh, what is it, uh, the British Royal Academy Journal of Philosophy, mm -hmm. Critical mm -hmm. Philosophy of Race, mm -hmm. uh, publishing in the North. If we all published in the North, who would publish in the SHAP? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who would, who would yeah. publish in our own mm -hmm. journal? So how do, we, how do we work together with administrators? Because we also don't want to create a situation whereby now there's a resistance or there seems mm -hmm. to be conflict mm -hmm. between mm -hmm. academics on the ground mm -hmm, and administrators, mm -hmm, senior executives. Mm -hmm. How do we work together to ensure right, that right, right. there's a cohesion here? Yeah. So I think there are multiple levels as well. Mm -hmm. uh, one is the question of leadership. Uh, who become 
leaders of our institutions. Mm. To what extent are they deeply immersed in the kinds of debates mm -hmm. that we are talking about? The need to valorize mm -hmm. African intellectual production uh, and the outlets of that production, uh, which means you know, where do you publish, mm. uh, becomes uh, part of that question. And, 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 and the many of us, um, if you look at how people become administrators, um, many of us, you know, are appointed on all sorts of other grounds, mm. um, usually political, um, which have very little to do with uh, academics. Um, and, and therefore, I think one of the questions we need to ask ourselves uh, is how do we appoint our leaders mm -hmm. for universities? To what extent is the criteria mm. intellectual or purely political with, of course, a dose of administrative competence? Secondly, how do we provide training mm. for our leaders mm. to be able to uh, run these institutions not only efficiently from a purely administrative mm. and financial um, model, because you have to run them efficiently, yes. uh, but also responsive yes. to this larger um, societal historic mission of transformation mm -hmm. for these institutions. And, 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 and the, in many African countries, uh, I know for a fact, uh, there are no opportunities mm. for those kinds of, uh, you know, development, leadership development opportunities. Uh, so that's, that's one of the questions. Uh, and, and then it also ties in internally. To what extent do you create structures that are accountable, yes. uh, you know, towards the mission of the institution, yes. which is knowledge production, knowledge dissemination through uh -huh. teaching. And it's about... Um, uh, as part of that knowledge dissemination is how you influence and are uh, impacted by, influenced by society mm -hmm. in terms of its pressing needs. To what extent are your questions that you are trying to answer really rooted, as I said earlier, in, in, in a relevant and responsive and responsible manner to what are the pressing issues of your society, not necessarily the pressing issues of Boston, mm -hmm. Massachusetts, uh, or London, England, mm -hmm but your society in its multiple special uh, levels, the mm -hmm. local, the national, the regional, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, so th those, uh, and, and, and if the, the academics enjoy academic freedom, not only in their ability to, to have free speech, but also to influence mm -hmm. institutional directions through the governance system. And structures. And yes. structures, yes. then, yes. Uh, you know, hopefully you have a situation whereby the intellectual direction of the institution, because fundamentally it's an academic yeah. institution, obviously, uh, will be influenced by those people who are engaged on a regular basis. So it ties, it touches on the issue of governance, yes. structures of governance and so on. So, but having said that, again, it is representative of a much larger problem mm. in which uh, whether you're talking about the arts, mm -hmm. you know, you get all these great African musicians. Of course, we love their music, we dance in the clubs or whatever, listen to, to them driving to work. But you don't get them to become part of the national conversation in a systematic, serious, and, 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 and sustainable way until they make it. Mm. In the Global North? In the Global North. So, Sign a contract with a yes, yes. global production company. So whether company. It's, it's, it's acting, it's, it's music, mm -hmm. uh, it's literature, mm -hmm. you name it, across the board, mm -hmm. there is a valorization of Hollywood, of the external, mm -hmm. of the global north. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, you know, I, I'll be very frank with you. When, when I was in, um, you know, before I came to North America, uh, um, you know, decades ago, um, you know, my, I was writing and all that kind of stuff, but nobody really took my stuff seriously until I relocated to the Global North. Mm -hmm. And I was given a certain, uh, and I remember I would get, even, even when I was in, uh, in as Vice Chancellor in, in Kenya, um, and now coming back, I'm getting more invitations to speak since I returned to the United States than when I was in Kenya. Than you had been when you were in Kenya. Mm. So again, I mean, it's the same person as me. Yeah. 
you know, haven't <laughs> changed. But yes. my location yes. does if, something. Does something in which I'm perceived to have more to say if I'm here. Or what I say when I'm here is taken more seriously mm. than when I'm on the continent. So this is part of that whole extraversion that we mentioned mm. earlier of, of um, and not only our scholarship, but everything yes. about us. And, 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 and it you know, sort of goes across the board. You find, for example, I mean, the, I'm gonna give uh, very two silly examples, but they are very uh, important examples, mm. which shows the depths of the sickness. One is um, African families, middle-class families, take enormous pride in their kids not speaking the local language. Mm. Or mm. Uh, certainly take pride um, in, in, in them speaking uh, with an accent mm -hmm. that is identifiably northern. northern. And, um, and, and we all say, oh, when somebody speaks English or French or you know, Portuguese, uh, talking of the colonial languages, uh, that approximates mm -hmm. the metropole. Mm -hmm. We elevate them. Mm -hmm. And the ones who don't, we assume they're actually dumb. Mm -hmm. When in fact, intelligence is not measurable uh, by, by the fact that you know, uh, you know uh, a foreign language. Uh, the second thing is, uh, if, if you look at standards of beauty, uh, the, one of the biggest markets in the world for skin lightening creams is, is Africa, mm. you know, together with India and parts of South America and, and, and the Caribbean. Um, and the, the approximation to whiteness in terms of standards of beauty is among ourselves. Mm -hmm. We have internalized it so deeply that, um, you know, if there are two people, two women, uh, talking from you know, sort of a male perspective, um, uh, one is light, one is dark, the chances are everything else <laughs> being the same, the preference in, 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 in attitude, where the beauty you know, contests or whatever, which are silly in my mm -hmm. view, they shouldn't be there. Uh, is, is that standard mm. is the approximation to whiteness. Mm -hmm. So we do this uh, culturally in terms of whiteness, mm. epistemically in terms of northern scholarships, uh, economically in terms of northern economies. northern economies in terms of sources of technology, sources of capital, regulations, uh, trade, of regulations economy, and policy. so on. Yeah, so, mm. so all these economy. things are about the externalization mm and therefore the denial of our own being, yes. of our own ontologies, yes. and our own epistemic autonomy. Mm. Uh, so at one level, the university is not an island. Mm. It's simply reflecting the, the, attitudes. the dominant mindsets mm. uh, and attitudes of, of, of our societies. Mm. But precisely because it's a concentration of brain power, by definition, mm. universities are concentrations of mm. brain power. Mm. We should use that concentration to be actually the leaders mm. in the transformative agenda, mm. in critiquing and understanding and suggesting alternatives mm -hmm. to this mindset. Mm -hmm. Because if we ourselves, <laughs> you know, are, are sort of captured by that mi uh, mindset, uh, it's very difficult to see how other sectors and other layers of society can uh, sort of break out of the, that imprisonment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because, I mean, we, we spend all our time supposedly thinking. Yes. Uh, to what extent are we deploying the thinking that we are paid to do, uh, that in, we <laughs> sort mm. of claim to be doing? To what extent are we using it to seriously examine our practices? Yes. And I go back to that thing about, because it's one thing to, to you know, you and I can write up, you know, anything about you know how this is great, decoloniality, decolonization, mm -hmm. let's do that. What is our actual practices mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. individuals, as groups, as, as institutions? institutions. Mm. Paul, I, I, I'm, I'm so grateful and, and, and aware of time, I'm going to, I'm going to pose a last question. Um, and we've traversed a bit of really lovely terrain here thinking about disciplinary knowledge as it relates to society, thinking about the structure and the governance of the African university, um, and how sometimes we, 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 we attempt to 
and I know this especially of the South African context, whereby we attempt to to have a university in South Africa as opposed to a South African university, and those are two different institutions, incredibly so. Um, I want to then come back to the Africa diaspora conversation. One of the critical challenges that I've picked up, having been at Harvard University for a while, and I don't think that this is a problem that is a Harvard issue or a Harvard problem, but for example, our good colleague in the uh, collection of African, uh, in the handbook, Palgrave Handbook of African Philosophy in 2017 asks this question in terms of African studies. Mm -hmm. African studies, or African and African American studies, triple A-S as we call it, tends to not pay attention to the first A. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious about our capacity to have genuine intellectual richness. So you ask earlier, how seriously are we reading, for example, the work of W.E. Du Bois? How seriously are we reading the scholarship of the African diaspora, right, um, in terms of colleagues who have been at the belly of the beast? Um, and I think that that question is, for me in any case, it is a dialogical question mm -hmm. that strikes up our capacity to speak to each other. Because one arrives, for example, as an Africanist, as we are called uh, in the global north, and as an Africanist, you are aware and you are engaging with the scholarship that is emanating from the global north. You are, and in fact, you are trained, I would say, even in full canon, right? You are trained in your own canon, in your own context. You are trained in the European, you are trained in the American, white American, you are trained in the African-American canon. Um, and you begin to then invite colleagues to say, okay, th th these are the languages, these are the four languages that I speak or am competent in. Um, how competent are our colleagues in, and, and, I, and I ask this question because you've led um, African Studies Centers, you have been at the helm of African Studies in the Global North, uh, and you have indeed been given a very, very prominent position um, of, of, of an African studies expert, in, mm -hmm. as you have said, because mm -hmm. of the geography mm -hmm. of location mm -hmm. in terms of mm -hmm. where you're speaking from. Um, and as an African studies expert, African studies leader, how has been your, what has, let me rather put it the question, mm -hmm. what has been your experience of right. the global right. north mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. an Africanist, African right, studies right, expert right. and specialist? Yeah, so, so the first thing is to um, understand, I think, the history of African studies in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I did a book, uh, two volume study um, years ago mm -hmm. called The Study of Africa. And, and what uh, sort you of- You love these two volumes. <laughs> yeah, it's, <laughs> It's easier to, to <laughs> yes, yes. sort of express yourself, Absolutely. I guess. So um, what, what, what I think is important is that people have to understand that while we talk of the global north mm -hmm. as a collective, there are different histories of studying Africa, mm -hmm. which are informed by the nature of those specific societies Science. and their historical connections with Africa. So for example, uh, you find that if you look at German African studies, the focus was really on language and, and sort of civilizational spaces. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even terminologies like Bantu were invented by mm -hmm. Germans. Mm -hmm. um, so the, 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 the focus is going to be different from Japan, in which Jap Japan's interest within its own society and in its engagement with African societies was really much more geared towards the sciences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not, not languages, mm -hmm. like in the German mm -hmm. context. And it created a very different type relationship. of relationship. The, Indian, uh, the Indians, uh, you know, their scholarship on Africa is, is of course informed by their colonial history, mm -hmm. which, which, you know, sort of parallels, mm -hmm. in some cases, African history. Mm -hmm. So their African studies is going to be very different. Mm -hmm. uh, the Scandinavians, their engagement with Africa is, is from sort of this soft power, you know, developmentalist agenda and their engagement with Africa and the kinds of things they emphasize will be different. So the first thing I always like to encourage people is not to generalize mm -hmm. even about the global north, mm -hmm. uh, or about African studies. Mm -hmm. They have p particularities mm -hmm. that, of course, they, they, you know, there are certain things that are run across the supremacy of, of, you know, sort of Western epistemologies and all that. But there are p particularities in terms of areas of emphasis. Now, we, when it comes to the United States, there is a very interesting history about African studies. Mm 
the people who started taking seriously the study of Africa were the HBCUs, mm -hmm. the historical black universities and colleges. And scholars in that tradition, the Du Boises, mm -hmm. the William Leo Hansberrys, uh, the, you know, the, uh, the Woodsons and so on, who were interested in analyzing Africa from a civilizational point of view mm -hmm. as a civilization with its own integrity mm -hmm. and a civilization that had contributed to the global concept of civilizations. Mm -hmm. So their questions were about the civilizational basis, integrity, development, contributions of Africa. Mm -hmm. So you thinking know, with political theories of or political systems of organizing society, everything across the board. Ethics. So they were interested in ancient Egypt, the, the, the Nile Valley civilizations, mm -hmm. their contributions to global scholarship. Mm -hmm. They were interested in the development of African systems of governance, mm -hmm. African, you know, so uh, uh, Du Bois's book, Africa and the World is mm -hmm. sort of an exemplar. And people like William Leo Hansberry looking at Africa in ancient times. Mm -hmm. So th they were interested in these fundamental questions of Africa's place in the world. Mm -hmm. The African studies that develops after World War II mm -hmm. in the historically white universities, mm -hmm. uh, beginning with Northwestern, mm -hmm. is interested in understanding Africa from the point of view of the American security apparatus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in its rivalry with the Soviet Union during the Cold War, because that that's after World War II, and the it's interesting if you are going to say African studies of of the HBCUs and the Du Boises is the African studies of civilization mm -hmm. and culture broadly. Mm -hmm. The African studies that emerges in the white universities is the African studies of development. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. a develop. It is it, 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 you know. The, 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 the post-war Marshall Plan, yeah. security. What, what, what is the place of Africa in terms of modernization? Yes. So the, they're interested, Resources. Yeah. So they're interested in prescription mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as to how Africa can move in this way, mm. uh, while the other ones are not interested in prescription. They're, they're interested in learning in from. Understanding. Mm. Mm. Now, the, what happens is that African studies is then sanctified institutionally and intellectually in the historically white universities and the African study, uh, the African, you know, uh, work of the Du Boises mm. is, is, is kicked out of the academy, as mm. it were. And then you get the uh, civil rights movement in the 19th, you know, from then, you know, of course, it's, it's, it's got iterations yes. of a very long period of American history. But the, the phase that starts after World War II in the 1950s, 1960s, yes. and, and, and the struggles by black students yes. for, um, you know, as they enter um, you know, white universities and they don't find themselves, mm. their struggles for inclusion, epistemic inclusion, mm. curricular inclusion, then lead to the creation of black studies departments. Mm. Africa, uh, African American studies, black studies, you know, the nomenclature varies. And at that time, you already have this thing that has been created tied to the state. The funding of area studies mm. was from the federal government, the US Department of Education, because it was part of the Cold War machinery. Mm -hmm. So you have African studies, which has established itself as part of the Cold War calculus. And then the agitation from the black students mm. uh, leads to the creation of another space, mm. which divorces Africa from them. Mm -hmm. If you looked at um, most African studies departments, at least at the time when I was director of the center, the majority of faculty were white mm. in African studies. Mm. Um, in fact, at that time, there were only three, three of us uh, who were black heading African studies in this country. The rest were white directors. Mm -hmm. So th the, the protection of that space as African studies constructed out of a Cold War agenda is a very powerful imperative. Yes. Removing it from the, 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 the students who are seeking black studies 
are not interested in Ameri you know, reinforcing American imperialism. Mm -hmm. They want a liberatory mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. epistemology, mm -hmm. not only about their own conditions in the United States, but also the conditions in their ancestral continent. Mm -hmm. So ideologically, there is a split. Intellectually, there is a split. Institutionally, there is a division. Mm -hmm. And it's only later that you begin to find a movement uh, you know, towards the creation of Africana studies departments. Mm -hmm. And that's really from the sort of 80s, 90s. And there are all sorts of forces behind that as mm -hmm. well. Part of it, ironically, is the entry of into this, uh, t uh, this solitude, the white and the black, the entry of African academics, mm -hmm. people like mm -hmm. myself, mm -hmm. who are, of course, also interested in the post-colonial developmentalist agenda, yes. which African studies kind of deals with, mm -hmm. but are also interested in the civilizational question of our place in the world, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which African American studies, uh, uh, black studies, um, has been dealing with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And out of that kind of, you know, those very Amalgam. complicated comp uh, you know, uh, developments, emerge this Africana thing yes. uh, that is, uh, and then in other places, of course, they will call it like here, African, African-American studies, mm -hmm. uh, Africana studies, you name it. But the, the point I'm simply trying to make is, one, is that we have to understand this, the, the struggles within specific countries, yes. how they lead to the development of particular institutional forms yes. of studying, of studying Africa. Africa. Mm. And the ways in which the studying of Africa, how it is configured uh, administratively mm. in terms of departments, centers, institutes, has a lot to do with um, dynamics of funding, mm -hmm. uh, which is both the institutional, the extra institutional, in this case the state is involved through these uh, Title VI, as they are called, Title VI programs for international studies, area studies, and so on. So the, 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 the you know, when I read a lot of stuff about African studies, you know, I remember there was, a, you know, somebody who did a piece a few years ago, and they were talking about, you know, they, uh, they didn't feel welcome at African studies conference when they came, they came here. I think the person was from South Africa. It's like, yeah, African Americans don't feel comfortable in African studies. They're not there. Yeah. So how do you expect you to be comfortable? Yeah. They were not created for your comfort. Yeah. They were created for something else. Mm -hmm. And part of the struggles in my, you know, in, in, in my own case, I remember, was to say, how do we make sure that we attract more black students mm -hmm. into African mm -hmm. studies? Mm -hmm. uh, and that, of course, uh, you know, begged the question, what kind of curriculum do we have in African mm -hmm. studies? How do we attract more um, you know, black faculty, mm -hmm. uh, African-American faculty, who've been removed from this field intentionally over the last four decades, since how do we bring them into the field? Um, how do we ensure that we conceptualize Africa? Even the way we conceptualize Africa mm. has, is gonna have a bearing. So in Afrocentric um, thinking, uh, they look at Africa as a whole continent. Mm. In African studies, it's sub-Saharan. Mm -hmm we have borrowed and bought into the Hegelian division of Africa into three. Mm -hmm. Hegel said Africa is actually three different things. Mm -hmm. There is uh, northern, uh, the northern part, which he called say, European Africa, mm -hmm. if we call it, if we can call it that. Then the interior, which he says the real Africa. Mm -hmm. And then the Nile Valley, which is tied to Asia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. African studies, is essentially a Hegelian construct. Mm. And unfortunately, many of us have bought into it on the continent mm. in terms of our scholarship. So you know, I've, I've been reading a lot of these books on decolonization, and they're all talking about sub-Saharan Africa, mm. they either consciously or, or subconsciously. Or subconsciously. And, and think, they don't incorporate North Africa. And I think part of it is, you know, we always say jokingly, in, in the philosophy departments uh, across the globe, or specifically in South Africa in any case, we always say we are still suffering from the hang-ups of the 
of Hegel's ghost. Oh yeah, in fact, that's a uh, Taiwo, uh, the the uh, the, uh, the, uh, yes. uh, the Nigerian philosopher, uh, you know, wrote a piece I think in two thousand. Early, the early, I think 2001 or thereabouts, you know, Hegel's ghosts. Yeah. Uh, and, and uh, you know, he was precisely making that argument. Uh, and, 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 and therefore, one of the first things we as, uh, you know, uh, people who are interested in Africa uh, have to understand the construct of Africa in African studies mm. is not necessarily the construct of Africa in African American studies. Mm -hmm. And one of the, you know, sort of uh, issues I had to deal with as director was where is the place of Arabic? The majority mm. of Arab, uh, Arabic speakers are African. So for me, Af Arabic is an African language. Yes. And, and um, so we had a little battle with uh, you know, the Center for Middle Eastern Studies uh, because I said Arabic has to be in, in, in African <laughs> studies because it is an African language. Um, and uh, anyway, it, it was very interesting. So even how we conceptualize yes. the basic terms of our discourse, there are going to be differences between the diaspora populations mm, and, and African and, and European uh -huh. populations and how we conceive that. And unfortunately, yeah. many of us are busy fighting the ghost of the European construct and not engaging the, the liberatory potential mm -hmm. of uh, the you know, other construct of Africa, particularly from the diaspora. Fantastic. Thank you, Professor Zaleza, for an exciting conversation. And I think it uh, gives us as young people, as the new generation of scholars, uh, um, the work that still needs to be done in terms of creating a relationship between the contexts that we find ourselves in and thinking about Africa. For those of us uh, who are joining us online, join us again next week when I talk to David D1, uh, the musician and rapper, as we think about the role and function of music as it impacts and changes the lives of African-American uh, youths, specifically black African-American masculinities. Uh, I am Sisebo Kumalo, your host, and I look forward to welcoming you next week to the Black Archive official podcast. <laughs>